A wise man once said, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And no city or house divided against itself will stand. This was, of course, the only man greater wisdom who had greater wisdom than Solomon, the Lord Jesus Christ. In moments after he says this, in Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 30, he says, Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the judgment day, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. End quote. Every tree will be known by its fruits, the Lord says. Every kingdom, ideology, every liturgy of life and worship, every man will be known by their fruits. Time avails us for a thorough study and blasphemy of the Holy Spirit this morning. But given the passage as a whole, we can conclude a couple things quickly. Blasphemy of the Spirit involved rejecting the Spirit's work promised in the new covenant. God promised the Spirit would come, do certain things, namely replace our hearts of stone into beating hearts that walk in His statutes. And to reject that would be blasphemy of the Spirit. God not merely wrote on tablets of stone, but on tablets of hearts in the new covenant. He would cause them to walk under that law, under the bright light of that lamp. Further, blaspheming the Holy Spirit included attributing the works of the Holy Spirit to the devil and the devil's works to the Spirit. As I quoted the fruits of the Spirit last week, I will again today, Galatians 5, 22-23, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, we must be abundantly careful here because many Christians would be tracking with what I'm saying. They would be giving their hearty yes and amen to all of it, but then fall prey to a false definition of love, a false definition of peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And to fall prey to a false, unbiblical definition of these terms, make no mistake, hear me on this, is to perversely attribute the fruits of the Holy Spirit to the fruits of the devil. To say something is love, that God would fundamentally say that is not love, even it is hate. And to say it is good and godly, it's Christian, it's something that comes from people filled with the Spirit, is to blaspheme him. For example, love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth, 1 Corinthians 13, 6. Therefore, as a modern example ever before us, it is unloving, even hateful, to attend a homosexual wedding, which is necessarily a celebration to rejoice in something perverse, or to affirm transgenderism, and to be clear, adultery of any kind, sexual morality of any kind, is not to be affirmed or rejoiced in. No matter how much the participants in that immorality call it love, and they do, it is not love. Because love has a standard. God is that standard, for he is love. Love is only found in truth, and God is the standard of truth. Jesus says, I am the truth. Paul concludes the list of the fruits of the Spirit by saying, against such things, there is no law. You can feast on those fruits of the Spirit all you want. You can eat them all the days of your life, all the hours of your life. Gluttony on such fruits is impossible. Elevensies, midnight snacks, 
If it be from that tree of the Spirit, don't ever second-guess eating it. Do, though, be very careful to make sure you're eating of the right tree, that your definition of love, goodness, and faithfulness are in line with God's definition as found abundantly throughout the Scriptures. One very easy way to test if your definition of love is in line with God's is to soberly assess if you actually hate what he hates. It can be easy at times to hide behind the word love. But after one of the most glorious articulations of the gospel in Romans chapters 1 through 11, Paul tells them in chapter 12 to therefore abhor or intensely, even violently hate that which is evil. Do you hate that which is evil? And is your definition of that which is evil in line with what God would call evil. One cannot love without also hating. They are two sides of the same coin. If you love children, you will hate abortion. If you love the true gospel, you will hate false gospels as they lead people astray and cannot save and deglorify the Son of God. I will again this morning read the list of evil acts that the flesh often desires, Galatians 5.19, sexual morality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these, end quote. So these are the desires and fruits of the flesh that we are to hate. While we are also to love the desires and fruits, that is the tree of the Spirit, this again requires the right definitions of terms, sexual morality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry. What are those things according to God? And we must then, after doing our diligence to learn the definitions of these terms, submit humbly, joyously to God's definition on these terms, trusting that he alone is the truth and the arbiter of truth, and he alone, as Jesus said, is good. He is good. Why am I starting here this morning? The very next line in Galatians 5 says, I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things, speaking to the bad fruits of the flesh, will not inherit the kingdom of God. We are in the book of 1 Kings, tracing the line of kings in the history of God's people in the Old Covenant. They were, in a very real and earthly sense, in the Old Economy, the Old Covenant, the kingdom of God. But they failed to prove themselves sons of God. They failed to walk and talk as their father walked and talked, to love what he loved and to hate what he hated. King David gave Solomon the kingdom of God on a gold platter. And we learned last week that Solomon, despite decades of good work, ultimately failed to inherit the kingdom of God, at least as he was really designed to do. I mentioned that last week I do believe Solomon inherited the eternal kingdom purely by the grace of God according to the covenant God made with his father. But my point is that he played the prodigal son at the end of his life. He played the prodigal son with his inheritance in the end. And Rehoboam, Solomon's son, would do the same. And Jeroboam would be grafted into the reign of kings through the kingdom's division. Jeroboam was adopted into the position of a son of a king, as if he was born in the royal line. But he was not. He was given an opportunity by the king of kings, given a shot to walk in God's ways. We saw that last week. And redeem the kingdom, which is the prerequisite to redeeming the whole world, but he too would fail and play the prodigal. The kingdom will double down today against itself, and it will not stand, but rather die and be buried below. Our text begins, Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. Shechem has a colored history in the Bible thus far, originally a Canaanite city when it's first mentioned in Genesis chapter 12, yet it's the very place that Abram receives God's promise of the land. It's also the place of Dinah's humiliation, Genesis 34, 
by the city's own namesake, Shechem, son of Hamor. Under Joshua, Shechem did in fact become a Levitical city of refuge, and it is where Joseph's remains were buried. Shechem now had become the capital city of the northern kingdom. So Rehoboam, Solomon's son, who dwells in the southern part of the kingdom, where Jerusalem is, heads north to keep his kingdom unified. That's his aim here. Would Rehoboam reveal his ways to be more Canaanite? as Shechem's roots were? Or would Rehoboam reveal his ways to be more in line with Joshua and Joseph? Would he be a faithful man in the line of Abraham? Would Abraham rejoice to see Rehoboam's day? Or not? Jeroboam, a high official over all the forced labor under Solomon, you'll recall, who was told last week that he would be king over the ten northern tribes by God directly through the prophet Ahijah, heard of Rehoboam's coming, and he also heads to Shechem. He fleed to Egypt. He hears that he's coming back, so he goes back to Shechem as well. Interestingly, though Jeroboam was told by the prophet Ahijah he would be king over the ten northern tribes, verses 3 and 4 of our text note that he joined, I think it's fair to even say led to a degree, in the offer that if Rehoboam just lightened the load of work upon the people of Israel, they would all serve him. The text notes that, that Jeroboam is participating directly in this request to Rehoboam. Just lighten the load, we'll all serve you. But think of this, this is after the fact he was already told you're going to be king over the ten northern tribes. Imagine a massive rally of people coming to hear Rehoboam. It says all of Israel was there. People as far as the eye can see. And they come and they make this simple pitch to him. And Jeroboam leads the charge of what you could potentially say was the first union. Perhaps one could even call it the beginnings of a democratic republic. At the top of this union is the guy who, funny enough, never got his hands dirty. Jeroboam's at the top of this totem pole, and he was the guy who was over all the forced labor during the entirety of Solomon's reign. He's the guy who never worked as a slave himself, but rather oversaw all those teams of slaves, the men and their children. And here he is representing the people, surely with their best interests in mind. He is on their side now, not Solomon's and not his son's. I confess it's very hard to discern where the truth and virtue really lie here in the story, at this point at least. This is a really juicy story. It's the very makings of a most watched drama. This is the pinnacle nation in the world. you got to put yourself in this time. The highest nation. They're about to divide. The king from the south goes to the north. There's a king there, essentially, who knows from God he's going to be king, but he's, he's playing along with the whole thing. Just lower the load. I'll be your servant too. And the author really leaves us in the dark a bit which I believe makes a lot of sense because darkness has already fallen upon the kingdom. The whole story is foggy in its morality. What was Jeroboam's play here? He was told he'd be king of the ten northern tribes last week. So if if Rehoboam, imagine, says, yes, I'll just lighten the load, what what would Jeroboam have done? Did he have a deceptive plan to stab him in the back after claiming uh, submission and respect to him? Did he just not believe or trust the prophet Ahijah that what God said through him would happen, that he would be king? I don't know the answers to these questions. But the story is about to get a lot more intense. It's about to get a lot more dramatic, but all downward in the depths of despair. Rehoboam knows as a son of the wise Solomon, you never make a big decision without seeking counsel. (laughs) He knows that much. You never make a big decision without seeking counsel, and that really is wise. So he says, give me three days. I'll answer you in three days about your request. The kingdom of God hangs in the balance, as far as we can tell. The people seem willing to get a deal done to keep the kingdom united, even Jeroboam. Seems all Rehoboam needs to say is, all right, deal. I won't put as heavy of a yoke upon you as my father. It really seems to me like an easy and modest play. We have then two sessions of counsel from two 
very different groups. The first is from the old men, the text says, verse 6, who were Solomon's own counselors. They said to him in verse 7, if you will be a servant to this people today and serve them and speak good words to them when you answer them, they will be your servants forever, end quote. Straightforward counsel. You serve them, they'll serve you. Meet their requests, lighten their yoke, and they will still work hard for you all your life even. Well, I think this counsel has very legitimate merit. I do think it's fundamentally flawed. The first reason I think it's flawed is because at no point does anyone, not Rehoboam, nor the old, even assuming they're truly wise men, seek the Lord. No one quotes a single word from God's word. No one consults the, the true prophet Ahijah. There will be others, but at least we know of one. Put simply, I would say they just weren't Christian about it. They had the appearance of godliness, and they might have even been truly godly men. And I firmly believe offered much better counsel than the second group, who we'll see in a second. But even this counsel failed because it fundamentally was rooted in their own wisdom instead of God's. Since they were the generation that lived during the time when there were a lot more real Christians amongst Israel... Real heart circumcised sons of Abraham, that is, their counsel was at face value more godly. But I don't believe it was actually godly. I could be wrong, I mean that, but it's my assessment for a number of reasons, as I'm stating. Most among them, because God and his word was left out of the counsel. And the reality is, Rehoboam needs a lot more counsel than just that. Remember the line I quoted from Jesus to begin the sermon, whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. Jesus is communicating an active walk with him, an active obedience unto God. There is no such thing as neutrality before God. No one is neutral before God. No one. Regardless of what they say. One is either gathering or scattering. That is the dichotomy that Jesus himself lays before us. One is either with Jesus, bearing the fruits of the Spirit through their union to God, their Father, by faith, or they are against Jesus and his Father. There's a spectrum there of how visibly you would be able to discern that, a wide spectrum even. But that is the dichotomy the Bible consistently paints. Many who are against Jesus seem neutral. They might even seem a bit godly. They will often say godly things, but prove themselves against God through apathy towards God's word, God's law, and God's loving sonship he offers, particularly through apathy towards God's family. To be a son of God means that you're in a family of God, which should result in real, tangible family fellowship week after week with the people. The old men fail to persuade Rehoboam minimally, and I'm not surprised, because if I were to summarize Could be wrong again, but my assessment is that they merely offered up the conservative values of 10 years ago, Israel, instead of the conservation of God's law and God's ways. They merely offered up what was good and godly 10 years ago instead of really getting to the heart of the matter. Be weary, church, of the term conservative and those who would label themselves as such. If they say that, ask them, what are you conserving? What are you conserving? conserving. Most in America, most in so-called conservative churches even, are conserving nothing more than the status quo of a decade ago. And that is largely a quote from uh, Mr. Eric Anderson, as many of us know. The question is, is what they're conserving actually godly at the root? Is it godly? Is it good? As the Bible says, Romans 13, the magistrate is... uh, Not a terror to good, but to evil. So we have to ask, what is good? What is evil? We have to define these terms according to God's word, the very arbiter of goodness and evil. That is the question you must ask yourselves at all times, but especially days before an election in a democratic republic. With all the votes that you have, ask yourself, is it fundamentally good? Dig below the rhetoric you will scarcely find anyone with superficially honest rhetoric. Verse 8 says, He abandoned the council and took the counsel of the young men who had grown up with him. Okay? 
The Hebrew for young men typically communicates a very young boy, an adolescent, a kid, both referring in the Bible to a young child and a goat. A virgin boy who has not married, still lives with his parents and has much maturing to do. Yet the commentators helpfully point out that Rehoboam is in his early 40s at this point. So the author is actually slighting them. He's undercutting these men. They're grown men, but he calls them young. He's calling them boys, though they are in their 40s, late 30s at the least. They should have been married for decades, and they might have even been. They should have had many children, much life experience. They should have been considered wise men and counselors of the city, always, always with more maturity to be gained, more wisdom to be gained. But these are not 10-year-olds. They're not even 20-year-olds, which in time, in this time, would have been much more mature than our average 20-year-olds, for the record, anyway. Why does the author slight them? Because they prove themselves foolish, aggressive, and even scandalous little boys. In men's bodies, of course. They respond, thus shall you say to them, my little finger is thicker than my father's thighs. And now, whereas my father laid on you a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions, end quote. Scorpions were sharp metal pieces attached to whips. Again, this is a dramatic story, one proving to be without any good king, but a plethora of drama queens. The Hebrew word thigh here most often means upper thigh, loins even. It's a scandalous way to say a strong statement, sensual even statement, with a faint remnant of wisdom, keeping them from saying it full bore. The counsel they give is not only scandalous rhetoric, but it's unnecessarily aggressive and highly divisive. Imagine here this scene. Imagine this. All of Israel is waiting for the word from the king. The kingdom hangs in the balance. If you have ever felt any weight, like any election is going to change things, multiply that times a thousand. This is how they feel. And in a room is a bunch of old wise counselors and younger counselors, middle-aged men, and Rehoboam sitting at the head of this table, getting counsel from both. The old say, let's just go back to the good old days, throw the dog a bone. The young say, I will destroy you just for even asking to lighten your load. Bow down. No one prays in the text. The first generation abandoned their love of God, but maintained an appreciation for much of his ways. The second generation, following the trajectory of their fathers, abandoned not only a love of God, but also an appreciation for his ways. I believe that's what we're seeing here. As it is written, Romans 3, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, no, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to... to shed blood, and their paths are ruin and misery, the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Romans 3, 10 through 18. Rehoboam received, I believe, one permissible choice with, with decent wisdom in it that likely would have bore some good fruit while I think still ultimately declining the nation due to its fundamental godlessness. And he received an altogether sinful choice rooted in nothing but a lust for power and comfort. Rather than consult God and his word, or maybe a third party here, rather than consult Ahijah the prophet, or actually just play the role of a king, as he should have already had these things a bit dialed in, he chooses objectively the worst and most sinful choice, breaking down the only dam keeping the kingdom together. Church, you must understand that everything that we call political is at some measure, often a very high measure, ethical, moral. Politics is often a synonym for ethics, as Brother Eric Anderson's uh, rhetoric has helped many see, myself included. Do not be fooled by the rhetoric that, for example, for example, abortion should not be a political discussion, or that laws should not be passed about it because what do politics have to do with 
a quote-unquote woman's body. Okay? The problem is abortion is the murder of a child. Therefore, the magistrate who is to protect, above all, I would argue, innocent children and punish evildoers who would harm innocent children must be able to weigh ethical decisions, moral decisions, and rightly punish accordingly. Murder is something the magistrate must be involved in. In fact, it's one of the only things I would say they should be involved in. It's their job to punish murderers and to, therefore, Romans 13, punish evil, which requires a a very elementary understanding of what a person is. Supreme Court Justice Kentanji Brown Jackson infamously was asked what a woman is, and she said she could not define what a woman is. When pressed, she said, quote, I am not a biologist, end quote. Listen, if she cannot define what a woman is, then she will not be able to rule justly in any case involving women at the least. Any case. If she cannot define... Furthermore, what a person is, she will not be able to rule justly in any case involving persons, which is her whole job. Yet she was praised. She's a, she's a current Supreme Court justice. The highest court in the world. This too is the judgment of God upon us, giving us exactly what we want. She was praised by a people who cannot think below the shallowest of waters, who have, by design of the magistrate themselves, who have a monopoly on education, made sure that the general population has never taken a class on logic or rhetoric, and their grammar classes are filled with false definitions, or just teachers who say, I can't define what a woman is either, in a biology class. The amount of deceptive rhetoric, not merely in the world, but flooding my mail the past few weeks before the election is is comical. Mostly because it must work otherwise, they would not spend billions of dollars on sending all these mailers out. Do not take the bait, church. Don't take the bait of the rhetoric. Be discerning. Be wise. Be cunning as serpents. Ask the deeper questions. For example, if a magistrate says, right, I'm sure you've all gotten a mail that says something like this, we need more taxes so that you can have clean water and better police response times. The question we should ask is, how much do you receive in taxes already, and where is that money going? Do you actually need more money to to literally have clean water or better police response times, or do you need to manage the money you already have better? Do you actually need to increase taxes, or would a tax reduction be best so that you can actually learn how to be more efficient? Additionally, while endorsements are worth considering, they should not immediately sway you. Be a Berean, consult the word of God, and think. Rehoboam failed to think. The old men, I would argue, failed to think as they really should have. The young men, who were really immature boys in men's bodies, abandoned thinking and wisdom altogether, as typically is the generational decline. The politicians of Rehoboam's day and ours would do well to spend daily time in the Proverbs. Proverbs 11.6, the righteousness of the upright delivers them, but the treacherous are taken captive by their lust. Proverbs 19.18-21, through 21, discipline your son, for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. A man of great wrath will pay the penalty, for if you deliver him, You will only have to do it again. Listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. End quote. The father who disciplines their son should be hopeful. The father who does not discipline has set his hope on putting his own son to death, the proverb says. A man of wrath will just keep being wrathful if you keep delivering them unjustly. Punish them, okay? Otherwise, you're just going to find yourself in the same problem over and over and over. Punishment is necessary for for change. It is discipline of God through the magistrate. Accept instruction that you may gain wisdom and always remember many are the plans of man. Many, many 
Many are the plans of men. We have been hearing them over and over and over, but the purpose of the Lord will stand, church, in that alone, which is exactly what our next verse says. So the king did not listen to the people, for it was a turn of affairs brought about by the Lord that he might fulfill his word, end quote. What Rehoboam did was sinful, and it was exactly according to the plan of God. Proverbs 21.1, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wills. Isaiah 45, 6 through 9, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west, there is none besides me, I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Shower, O heavens, from above, and let the clouds rain down righteousness. Let the earth open that salvation and righteousness may bear fruit. Let the earth cause them both to sprout. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe to him who strives with him who formed him. A pot among earthen pots. Does the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Or your work has no handles? End quote. Isaiah 46, 9 through 11, for I am God and there is no other. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God, there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose, calling a bird of prey from the east and the man of counsel from a far country. I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed and I will do it, end quote. From a bird of prey, not a single bird of prey travels without the Lord's declaration and purpose, nor a single man of counsel amongst any magistrate that has ever existed. All things happen according to the declaration of God. He declared the end from the beginning, and he did not merely know what would happen. Rather, he declared it. He determined it. His counsel, his word, his plan would stand. He said, I will accomplish my purpose. I have spoken. I will bring it to pass. There is an infinitely wide chasm between you and the Creator, the creation and the Creator. You are not your own. In Christ, you are bought with a purpose with a high price of his blood. But even outside Christ, no one is their own. They are merely created beings sustained every moment by their God. You are not sovereign. You are not the lawgiver, and therefore you have no right to judge the law. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. We have been dying since we were born, my friends. Each day dawns us one day closer to our last. And no one can do anything about it except the Creator. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He had no beginning, nor does He have an end. All that exists only exists in and through Him, by Him, and for Him. He is the author of the whole story, and by story I mean reality. Hebrew says His Word upholds the universe. The Bible plainly and repeatedly reveals that God is so sovereign. He is so sovereign. You will ask questions like we find in Romans 9, verse 14. Is there injustice on God then? Verse 19, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? If you're tracking with Paul's arguments in Romans 9, you will ask these questions. And when the questions are asked, Paul doesn't respond with, oh my gosh, you were totally misunderstanding me. Man is very free. He is so free. I completely botched my teaching lesson on God's sovereignty and man's responsibility, or commonly called this emphasis on free will. Paul responds with nothing of the sort. He does not say, let us emphasize man's free will together. Please forgive my mistake. No, the Apostle Paul says, rather, he asks, you're tracking with my argument, 
okay? And then he answers those questions with verses 18, 20, and 21 in Romans 9. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Who are you, O man, to answer back to God? But what does molded say to its molder? Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? End quote. God does not respond to these questions with a multi-hour lecture establishing, let alone defending, man's free will. And man does have freedom of his will according to his desires. Man has a, a wide spectrum of freedom amongst his will. But when most people say free will, they're talking about a a libertarian free will, able to do anything, sin, not sin, righteous things. We are bound by our desires. We're bound by our nature, and we are by our nature sinful until God gives us a new nature, and we are new creations in Christ. God's response to the questions is, who are you, O man, to answer back to me? Will the clay pot snap back at its potter? Can a cereal bowl slap your hand in the morning when you go to grab it? and cry out, you will not use me today for your purposes. You take that cereal bowl and you smash it on the ground. That's what I would do right away. I'm going to probably get some Pentecostal to come pray for my house because they got weird things going on. But God is merciful. God is very merciful. Mercy to no end. He really is the potter and we are the clay and yet his mercy extends. We are the pot that has slapped him across the face over and over and over and over and he's been so merciful to give us new life, to give us beating hearts, to give us his son crucified, buried and risen for us to give us his kingdom. The division of the kingdom that we're reading about in our text came at the hand of God, it says, and his word would stand. At the same time, God tempts no man to sin. God is not the author of sin. In fact, God made a good world. He said it's good, and it's good, and it's good, and they said it's really good. God made a world that was good, and man sinned. According to the sovereign plan of God, yes. Was man responsible? Absolutely. Was Adam a pre-programmed computer? designed to sin? No, in fact, he was pre-programmed to do good. He had no sin per the design of God, but he chose evil, which would simply be anything other than what God had told him to do or leave undone. Sin, in some ways, is a non-entity. The Bible sometimes talks of it as an entity, a thing, to help us understand it, but it's also important to emphasize it's a non-entity. It's not really a thing. It's not something you step in and it's on your shoe. It's not a hole that we fall into as we often confess. Sin is the absence of doing what God commanded. It's the absence of walking with God. We're all walking. Are we walking with him or with someone else? Sin is doing the opposite of goodness. Sin is participating in the unfruitful works of darkness as opposed to the fruitful works of light and the spirit. You're going to be participating in one or the other. God is wholly sovereign and man is wholly responsible for his actions, including his inactions. This is not only the consistent declaration of the Bible, but it is our experience. Think to your last sin. Did God put a gun to your head? By no means. In fact, God likely provided a thousand ways out of that temptation. Did you then thwart the sovereign plan of God in your sin? No. No man can thwart his plans. God orchestrates evil men to accomplish evil things all according to their evil desires. God orchestrates evil men to accomplish evil things all according to their evil desires. But ultimately, ultimately and always to the glory of God and the good, the good of his people. This is best seen in the cross of Jesus Christ. Acts 4.27, For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. End quote. They all gathered against Jesus, the whole world, to do whatever God's hand and God's plan had predetermined to take place, which was to crucify Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The Messiah. 
Did this mean the world was innocent? By no means. Read the Gospels and read the book of Acts. They were choosing to be wicked because they loved wickedness. They acted wickedly to feed their lusts. And what they meant, what they meant for evil, as Genesis concludes on the story of Joseph, what they meant for evil, God meant for good. In fact, the good of the whole world. Jesus was the good king that they had all been waiting for, for he was God walking with them like Adam had in the garden. But they squandered it, just like Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Rather than consult the scriptures and recognize the God of the scriptures right in front of them, they consulted wicked counselors, varying degrees, and concluded in unison Israel all came together, a divided kingdom, unified with one cry in the gospel accounts, crucify him. Perhaps the most unified Israel had ever become. They said our fathers were brutal to the prophets and godly, placing a heavy yoke on them, killing them even as Jesus emphasized. But on you, Jesus, we will place the heaviest of yokes. We will bring forth whips with scorpions. We will tear you to pieces. We will nail you to a tree naked for everyone to see. We will crown you with thorns. All the curses of God be upon you and inscribe in mockery above your head. King. These were the fruits of Solomon. These are the fruits of Rehoboam and Jeroboam, the fruits of Father Adam. These were our fruits, church, for our sin nailed him there. Had you been among the crowd or among the council of Rehoboam, do not fancy yourself. Apart from the grace of God giving you eyes to see in mercy, you would have given the same godless counsel and watched the kingdom crumble, crumble like a cave during an earthquake, burying everyone inside without hope. The people responded faithlessly to Rehoboam's decision, asking, what portion do we have here in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, look now to your own house, David. Is this all it took to forsake the promises of God? One generation later, and they all conclude against God's glorious covenantal promises to establish his Messiah over the world on the throne of David that they will have no part in him? This is theirs. To theirs are the covenants. To theirs are the blessing. To theirs is the kingdom. And right away, one bad word, and they say, we're done. This is like a child having the most enjoyable day ahead of them with all their favorite things, people, food, and activities. But when mom asks them to merely brush their teeth before they all head out, the child throws a fit and ends up saying, you know what? I don't want any part in this day. I'll go stare at a corner of my wall in misery. Oh, the folly and the pride. Was there anyone in the kingdom with wisdom? What we find out is no. The foreign worship of Solomon brought, destroyed them all. It had enculturated all of them into demonic desires. Rehoboam then sends Adoram, or Adoram, the new Jeroboam, who would oversee all the forced labor, thinking he would just waltz right in there, Tim waltz right in there, like a token representative for the dark establishment, and bring order through tyranny. That was what, that was his whole object. Hey, I'm going to get out of here. You go out there and you just, Start the forced labor. I know they're not for it, but like, you got this. To no one's surprise, the next says, all Israel stoned him to death. Rehoboam, knowing he was next, then really fled to Jerusalem where he gathered 180,000 men to fight against the north. But God spoke through Shemaiah, the man of God, to not fight against his own relatives. They're all family. And they actually listen, leaving the kingdom divided into north and south, Israel and Judah. I'm going to make a brief note in the U.S. Second Amendment in the light of this because I believe it's very important. The people of Israel at this point were not righteous. That'll be proven in the next the conclusion to our text. We'll get to in a moment when they all just go gladly worship false gods. Yet they were also in the right to resist tyranny here. Magistrates are but men like you and I, and everything the magistrate does, they do by the sword. Romans 13, this is actually their right. And to be use modern language and to be blunt for the sake of time, everything the magistrate does, they do with a gun to your head at the end of the day. Was it right for Israel to stone Adoram? I would say at least potentially, and I would lean on the side of yes for numerous 
reasons. I'm not going to reiterate, but things we've discussed last chapter in this chapter. The Second Amendment, ratified in 1791, reads, A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to, bear, to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, end quote. Now let me be very clear. The Second Amendment is not about owning guns so you can hunt. It's not about owning guns for self-defense. Not against an intruder in your home. It's not at all what the Second Amendment says. It doesn't say for the security of your free home, you may own guns personally. It says a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the people shall keep and bear arms. Those are other good reasons to own guns, hunting, protecting your family, but they are not why the founders wrote and ratified the Second Amendment. They wrote and ratified the Second Amendment for the security of a free state by a militia. Coming off the coattails of tyrannical Britain and the Revolutionary War victory, the establishment of the Second Amendment was so that no government could again tyrant over them, at least not without a fair fight. As a guy who just went through the nearly two-year process, toilless process in CA to get my CCW, sitting through hours of class and talking to many seemingly pro-Second Amendment guys, I am astonished at how far we have come from the basic heart and aim of the Second Amendment. There was not, not exaggerating, not a single mention, not a word from anyone at any point in the two-year process, hours of classes, filling out paperwork, anything from anyone. The 40 or so guys I took the class with, not one time, a 12-hour class, supposed to be eight hours, 12, I am still a little bitter about it, not one time did they say the Second Amendment is to protect against the magistrate's tyranny. <laughs> These are the dudes. These are the Second Amendment guys. They got all their stickers. They got all their stuff. They got tattoos. <laughs> and they're over here submitting to a 12-hour class for an eight-hour thing. By hour four, I was like, hey, dude, I plan to pay you to get out of here. I shouldn't even have to take this class. I should be able to own a gun and put it on my hip and walk around. And if I do something criminal with it, then yeah, I should be punished. And if I don't, I should have the freedom to do this. Constitutional. The Constitution is my government. I'm submitting to my government. The people, after decades of faithful work under Solomon and after a modest plea to have less strenuous slave labor, they see a king twice as cruel, sinfully domineering over them, but one would be shocked at how quickly... The seeming strong man with the crown proves himself a coward when the people reject his tyranny with even just a bit of force. Such matters, church, take great wisdom. If you read the reasons why in the Declaration of Independence they chose to fight, it's a, a great slowness to anger. It's a lot of patience and enduring hardship to the point where they decide we're going to use force. We must be very wise, but as the proverb said, a man of great wrath will pay the penalty, for if you deliver him, you will only have to do it again, and that goes both ways. Our text concludes, now the kingdom will turn back to the house of David. This is Jeroboam talking, contemplating, recognizing something. He says, the kingdom will turn back to the house of David. If this people go up to offer sacrifices... In the temple of the Lord of Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn again to their Lord, to Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So the king took counsel and made two calves of gold. And he said to the people, you have gone up to Jerusalem long enough. Behold your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. End quote. Verse 31 says he made temples in the high places and he appointed priests from among them. The only qualifier, you can't be a Levite. He appointed feasts just like Judah and made sacrifices. Jeroboam went and found some counsel, the text says. Is it the same people? I, I have no idea, but it's absolutely atrocious counsel. Just like Rehoboam did, and it proved to be fatal counsel. Church, bad counsel kills. It kills. Bad counsel kills. And it damns 
I'll be clear as a shepherd trying to protect the sheep. Do not listen to bad therapists. Okay, therapists are, that's a synonym for counselors. People pay them hundreds of dollars an hour to go receive damnable, destructive counsel. It's astonishing. Don't, don't go receive bad counsel. I'll give you counsel all you want for free. That's my job. And I just get paid a wage. I'll, give, I'll meet with you as long as you have to to go through anything to give it to you for free. And the only reason my counsel has any weight and worthiness to it is because I'm going to consult God's word and his counsel. And where I stray from that, it'll be bad counsel. Don't listen to me. And where it is in line with it, it's really, really good counsel, regardless of whether it's coming from a donkey or someone else. Don't go to the bad counselors. And they're all over the place. You don't just need to go pay to sit in a room with them. They're, they're everywhere. If they're not Christian, they are at best like the old men in our text, and at worst, they are like the young men. Okay? Make sure they're Christian, and if not, just be aware of what you're stepping into. Even if they don't give counsel in your time with them, the absence of correction and counsel is itself a problem. Many say, well, I go to my therapist. I don't, they don't really tell me what to do. That's also a problem. They should probably tell you what to do. If you're going there with a list of decisions that got you into a really bad spot, they, they should probably tell you, hey, don't do that. Don't do that. Good counsel saves, namely the counsel of the gospel. Take the gospel. Receive the gospel. Receive Christ. Bad counsel kills. We see that in our text. Living with wise counsel around you is also just a way of life. Do not merely seek reactionary counsel when all the bad decisions have bore their fruit. Okay, that's a good decision, if you find yourself where I've already made the bad decisions, now I need reactionary counsel, then go find it. But don't live that way. Live a life surrounded by wise counselors all the time. I often emphasize to people, reactionary counsel, expect to sit with me for hours. Proactive counsel, it might be five minutes. Hey, don't do that. We're good. I'll save you hours just with me alone, let alone other heartache. Don't merely seek reactionary counsel. Seek proactive counsel. Live with wise people, and you will live in the sweet forests of good fruit. Conclusively, Jeroboam knew, church, we see here, that true worship would change the people's hearts back to God in the line of David. So he instituted false worship modeled after the true worship. It's one of the oldest plays in the book, and we must be very on guard against it. Many sermons could be preached on this final portion of the text, but what you must know is what I emphasized last week. Everyone is a worshiper. We are not first and foremost homo sapien, literally translating wise men. If 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Kings 11 and 12 have taught us anything, we're not first and foremost wise men, homo sapien. We are homo adorans. We are worshipers. We are men who function according to our desires. There's something deeper in us, something more fundamental than rationality that can even overcome wisdom. Solomon had the wisdom. He really had it. He held it greater than anyone else in the world, and it was not enough. Wisdom could not save him. It could not keep him. It's a very good thing to have. The Proverbs say to sell your jewels to buy wisdom, but it's not enough. He allowed foreign women to grow his heart towards foreign and false gods. This was a process. It didn't happen overnight. He didn't marry a thousand women in a night. Wisdom is not enough to save you, let alone knowledge or basic understanding of reality or being some expert in a specific field. We love experts these days. And I love experts when I'm trying to get something done. I need someone who knows what they're talking about. But don't therefore attribute to them wisdom We must seek the Lord humbly for new hearts. That's what we must do. As Pastor Sean so wonderfully put it in the pardon of sin, we must repent and believe upon Christ. We must repent and believe upon Christ. We must actually love what he loves and hate what he hates. We must by faith trust that he loves to give the humble such hearts to meet their every request. Luke chapter 12, always giving more of the Holy Spirit to those who ask. Always, always, always. You ask, he gives him. What a great promise, church. You want the fruits of the Spirit, ask in humble faith and he will give. 
We who are at the most fundamental level, homo adorans, men who adore, we are worshipers. And everyone at all times is operating according to a liturgy, a pattern of life modeled around whom they worship, what they worship. As James K.A. Smith argues, we are homo liturgicus, or liturgical men. Everyone is finding some conformity. Oh, it's football season, and then it'll be baseball season, and then I'll keep this rotation going until I die. We find whatever the liturgy of life is that we want, that we desire, and we worship. And this is exactly what we are observing in 1 Kings, particularly in Jeroboam's strategy. He is confident that the Israelites will grow again to worship the true God if they go down to Jerusalem and participate in that liturgy. These are sinful people, and he's like, if they go down there and they participate in the liturgy, they're going to end up worshiping the true God. Don't want that, because then they'll go submit to that king. And so, I'll provide for them other, another liturgy. He sets up false worship, a liturgy actually modeled after the true liturgy but filled with falsehood, and it works like a charm. God, he institu- uh, God instituted feasts for us to participate in with gratitude, ultimately the broken bread of Jesus and the cup of Christ's blood, but Jeroboam says, I'll institute a feast unto idols. God instituted a temple where he dwells, and he said, I'll create a temple where idols dwell golden calves. God instituted priests and teachers, and I'll avoid any Levite in my land and institute my own priests who will join the people of God, mediate for them between these golden calves and them. I will blaspheme the Holy Spirit, the Father and the Son, and I will be king forever, thus saith Jeroboam. Foolish, demonic, damnable, but we must give credit where it is due. Crafty, very crafty, coming from a man who definitely spent a lot of time with the wisest man on earth, cunning like a serpent, but for evil. His plan was crafty. You could even, in a perverse way, call it a really, really wise plan. But wise unto death, because the beginning of true wisdom is a fear of God. Church, be wise and notice the false altars around you, the false feasts, the false gospels, the false priests. We talk about them all the time here. They exist in the high places of the magistrate, the high places of education and medicine. They exist all over, not merely in the high, but even in the low places. Just because they don't use the same language, which is a demonic tactic, of temple, priest, prophet, or worship does not mean they're doing anything different. Everyone has their temple they make sacrifices to and in. Everyone has their priests and prophets that they listen to. Everyone has their communion table and the fellowship that they come to that table with. Everyone has their preference of worship through song. Everyone makes sacrifices and brings their offerings to a God. Every glass of water is either consumed to the glory of the one true God, namely Christ, Jesus, or unto an idol. And it takes a particularly wise man and woman to see all these things. That is a man and woman who fears God and by his mercy have received such eyes of which he loves to give. A people who have not blasphemed the Spirit, but rather humbly houses him. (laughs) Sounds blasphemous to me, but it's true. And joins themselves each day and week in worship with others who house him. Worship is the warfare of the Christian, so worship rightly, my friends, and see the kingdom conquest. Worship rightly and see the Son of David, Jesus Christ, Prince of Peace, risen from the grave on the throne of David. See the increase of his government and peace with justice and righteousness forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let's pray. How humble we are before you, Lord. We speak of things far too excellent for us. Far too excellent. Help us to believe them. And by that that belief, help us to live in the light of them. To the glory of King Jesus. We ask these things in his name. Amen.